Welcome to Organic Chemistry 2 Synthesis. Uh, synthesis itself, a word derives from ancient Greek and Latin and means to put or to place things together. Yeah? And uh, this is precisely what we'll be looking at, how to bring molecules together to, to make completely novel compounds. Um, and we'll start uh, out by looking at uh, some of uh, the functional groups that you've come across already. Uh, and these are alcohols and amines. Let's jump straight in. Organic synthesis is a fairly young field, but a very important one. Yeah? Just in the 20th century alone, 22 Nobel Prizes were won in organic synthesis. Yeah? It's the start of organic synthesis is marked by the uh, rational synthesis of urea by the, uh, the German chemist Wöhler in 1828. And you can see here that uh, during the early years of organic synthesis, simpler targets were considered. Yeah? Chemists attempted to connect known starting materials to these targets, um, but as the complexity of a target molecule increased, this became more and more difficult and uh, higher levels of planning were needed and new reactions uh, needed to be developed. Then after the Second World War, we see um, a dramatic development in the field of organic synthesis. Yeah? This was facilitated by rapid progress in um, well, electronic theory and mechanisms of organic reactions in conformation analysis and uh, also in the fields of analytical and chromatographic techniques, yeah? as well as crystallographic and spectroscopic techniques. Yeah? And this leads to such uh, wonderfully complex and large molecules as, see, as you see here at the bottom and the bottom right hand side of this slide. Carbonyl compounds that you have met uh, at the beginning of this course, uh, as well as alcohols and amines are omnipresent. Yeah, so you will find them in painkillers or so-called analgesics, yeah, so in anti-inflammatories like aspirin or ibuprofen. Uh, you will also find them in the flavor compounds, yeah, so-called aromatics, like for example vanillin and uh, raspberry ketone, yeah, two flavor compounds, artificial flavor compounds. Uh, which you will find in ice creams or in yogurts. And you see that uh, these functional groups um, play some important roles here. Yeah? So um, here in the example of vanillin, for example, our alcohol uh, uh, contributes to overall conjugation throughout this molecule. So you know that oxygen has a, has a lone pair yeah, that can be delocalized into this molecule. and onto our aldehyde functional group over here. In raspberry ketone, yeah, we have uh, the same behavior of the oxygen lone pair. Yeah. Here we are again delocalizing over para yeah, throughout the entire molecule. Yeah, and in nicotine, yeah, you have um, several amine functionalities, yeah, like for example this pyridine ring here. Then uh, we have dye stuffs, yeah, like for example uh, the dye of blue genes, indigo. Yeah, in fact, this is present in 25% of all genes. So here again, our our nitrogen lone pair contributes to uh, delocalization across this molecule. Or uh, here at the bottom left hand corner, palinyl, yeah, BASF's optical brightener for cotton and polyester. So here you have a conjugated system that runs uh, through the whole molecule. And you will also find these functionalities have uh, uh, great importance in biological processes. Yeah? So, uh, for example, here we have benzo apyrene, yeah, or BAP for short. So, BAP is a, a procarcinogen. Yeah? So, that means um, it becomes a carcinogenic compound um, after enzymatic metabolism. Yeah, so um, enzymatic metabolism leads to this uh, 
Babdiol epoxide. Yeah, so we have two uh, two alcohol groups and one epoxide functionality here. Yeah, we'll come back to the epoxides later, uh, but you can see it here already. This is a free-membered ring. Yeah, extremely strained and hence susceptible to attack. Yeah. And what can in fact happen in biological processes is that this uh, BAP-diol epoxide um, intercalates into DNA yeah? and the electrophilic epoxide can then be attacked by, for example, nucleophilic guanine bases. Yeah? So here you have your nitrogen lone pair on guanine that can open this epoxide and form a new nitrogen carbon covalent bond, yeah, irreversible, well, bonding this uh, BAP uh, um, uh, compound to DNA, yeah, and causing damage, and then you can pretty much reprotonate this epoxide on opening, yeah, and you get a third OH functionality on your BAP. Let's now have a look at how to make uh, your alcohol functionalities. Yeah? And this is a bit of revision um, and ties in nicely with the carbonyl part of the course. So you've, you've seen this before. Um, essentially, we can make an alcohol by a nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group. Yeah? So the mechanism is straightforward. We have an sp2 hybridized carbon um, that can be attacked by a nucleophile. generate your, so this, this step is slow, you generate your tetrahedral intermediate here. Protonate your oxygen here. Yeah, so the protonation is fast, and you generate your OH group here at the end. Now, the way how this works from the orbital perspective is that your uh, your electron yeah, sitting here on your nucleophile. So this will be your HOMO, your highest occupied molecular orbital. And this will interact with the LUMO of your carbonyl group. So this is your the pi star orbital here of your carbon-oxygen bond is the LUMO. And like so, yeah, you, you find some form of uh, interaction between the HOMO and the LUMO and you add your nucleophile to the carbon. Yeah? And the trajectory of this attack is pretty much at uh, 100 approximately 109 degrees angle, yeah, so a roughly tetrahedral attack that leads to a tetrahedral product. Remember from the carbonyl part of the course that uh, carbonyl compounds, especially aldehydes, are prone to hydration. Yeah? So the mechanism for this uh, hydration of carbonyls is the same as we've seen on the last slide. Uh, it's essentially a nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl bond. Yeah? And in this particular example, yeah, in the hydration, water is our nucleophile. Yeah? So we can uh, draw the mechanism in analogously, yeah, starting out with our free electron pair on our water. It attacks our sp2 
electron deficient carbon here. Yeah, so you get your water added there and a negative charge on your oxygen. Now you can pick up one of the hydrogens here. And reprotonate your anion. And like so, you generate your hydrate. So effects, uh, so these are all, um, all these protonation, deprotonation steps and the nucleophilic addition steps are all in equilibrium. Um, now we can influence this equilibrium by the nature and uh, size of these R groups, which you see here attached to your carbon ion. Yeah? So uh, if we consider the equilibrium constant of this hydration react reaction K, uh, we see here at the very bottom of this slide um, the different rates of this hydration reaction. Yeah? So as we go from, we start out here with our ketone and two methyl groups attached to our carbonyl. So this would, in the protonation reaction, this would uh, be a, an equilibrium constant K of 0.001. Now this protonation works uh, uh, a thousand times faster the moment that we replace one of these methyl groups by hydrogen, yeah, so uh, in our aldehyde, and uh, with only two hydrogens, we again a factor of 2000 faster, yeah, uh, in this hydration reaction. So you can see here in this, in this series that as we um, reduce, yeah, steric crowding um, of our tetrahedral intermediate, yeah, so. So these stages here, as we redu reduce the steric crowding of the tetrahedral intermediate, yeah, and of our product, we also speed up the rate of the hydration reaction, yeah. So let's put this into words here: reduction of steric crowding. of our tetrahedral intermediate and the resulting product. So the less sterically hindered our sp2 carbon is, the faster um, is this uh, hydration reaction. Now um, steric effects are one thing, yeah, we also uh, we can also have electronic effects. Yeah? So in particular, electron withdrawing adjacent uh, groups, yeah, adjacent to our carbonyl, for, uh, uh, favor the reaction with a nucleophile. Yeah. So here we have uh, three chlorine substituents, and here in this case, six fluorines, and you can see the uh, increase. Uh, of our equilibrium constant going from um, three chlorine to six fluorine uh, substituents, yeah, from 2000 to 10 to the power of six. Yeah, fluorine, of course, being the most electronegative um, substituent you can imagine. So this is uh, this carbon here is highly delta positive now. Yeah, so hence uh, it is a uh, yeah. Uh, it is a uh, it will attract the, the nucleophile, yeah, and speed up the rate of nucleophilic attack. So more electron withdrawing R groups. Accelerate the hydration reaction.
So we've seen on the last slides that um, a nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group could be a good way of making alcohols. Yeah, however, in the case of a hydration, we've seen all of these steps were fully reversible. Yeah, so once you get to the hydrate, it's very easy to revert back to the carbonyl. So if we really want to set out making an alcohol from our carbonyl compound, we need uh, um, to add a nucleophile which is unlikely to leave. Yeah, so a bad leaving group. And what could be worse, a worse leaving group than an H minus. So uh, here in this, on this slide, we'll be looking at um, borohydride reduction of our carbonyl. Yeah, so um, sodium borohydride um, is uh, the standard reducing agent yeah, uh, for aldehydes and ketones. And essentially the way how this works is um, uh, you react your carbonyl compound with sodium borohydride and later protonate to recover your alcohol. Yeah? So the solvent is usually water ethanol, and as we said, effectively this is the attack of an H minus, yeah, so a nucleophile. Um, however, uh, never draw this, yeah. So H minus would be way too reactive to uh, to exist, yeah. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, yeah, aldehydes react much faster than ketones in this particular reaction. Now let's have a look at the mechanism of this addition. So. Um, Effectively, yeah, as we said, um, our sodium borohydride is uh, an, an effective source of H minus or an H minus equivalent. Yeah, so this is our nucleophile. So we are forming a new covalent bond between carbon and hydrogen. Yeah, and we break the carbon oxygen bond here, this double bond. Yeah, so this is this uh, step is again as we as we've seen on uh, the first slide, this is slow, yeah. And now we have our uh, alcoholate, yeah. So our um, alcohol anion here, O minus, which uh, quickly protonates, yeah. So this is the acidic workup. So the second step, the protonation step, is fast. And we get our alcohol. Yeah. Again, we can consider the orbitals. Yeah. We have again an approach uh, from a roughly tetrahedral angle here. So our homo in this reaction is our sigma bond here between boron and hydrogen. And our lumo is our carbonyl pi star. Let us now have a look at organometallics as carbon nucleophiles. Yeah, so organometallic reagents, as the name suggests, um, have a carbon metal bond there somewhere. So uh, let us consider the nature of this carbon metal bond uh, by having a closer look at the electronegativities of the partaking elements. Yeah? So here we have the electronegativity of carbon, yeah, 2.5, and of lithium and magnesium, 1.0 and 1.2 respectively. So as you can see from these electronegativities, um, these two metals here are electropositive compared with carbon. Yeah? So the moment that you make a carbon lithium or carbon magnesium bond, you're essentially polarizing the bond towards a more electronegative carbon. Yeah, so these are electropositive. So um, we can uh, express that in terms of partial charges. So we can situate a delta negative charge on carbon and a delta positive charge on our metal. Yeah? So as a consequence, our organolithium or organom, uh, organometallic reagent um, generates a good carbon nucleophile. Yeah?
Yeah, so this will be our good carbon nucleophile uh, that can then attack the carbonyl group. So uh, let's have a look at such a reaction in example number one. So here we have a reaction of nephile lithium with an aldehyde. Yeah, so again we can uh, we have a delta negative charge on our carbon and delta positive charge on our lithium. So in the first step, yeah, we again have a nucleophilic attack on our sp2 hybridized planar carbonyl carbon and we break this carbon oxygen double bond here. Yeah, so in the first step we're making uh, our carbon-carbon bond. So, and uh, like so, you are generating your tetrahedral intermediate, your anion. And in the second step, we can protonate this anion yeah, in a workup. And we recover our alcohol. Yeah? Same works here in example number two on the right hand side with uh, cyclohexanone yeah, and phenyl lithium. So you get your well, highly substituted alcohol here. Yeah, so you can see from these two examples that um, we essentially uh, our organolithium reagent reacts as reacts as an R minus equivalent and as a Li plus. Yeah. So for the first step, yeah, we have to be uh, working under strictly anhydrous conditions. Yeah, as our organolithium reagent reacts vigorously with water, yeah, to give our ROH, yeah, so our alcohol outright. Yeah. So um, let's have a look at this reaction in terms of orbitals again. Yeah. So the home orbit in this reaction. So again, situated in our nucleophile. So this is our lithium carbon sigma bond. And the corresponding LUMO is, as in the all other examples, our pi star of a carbonyl. How do we prepare such organometallics? Well, we can uh, start working with, let me just bring up a laser pointer. We can start out with our organic halides and react them with lithium metal. Again, under strictly anhydrous conditions, for example, in diethyl ether, um, to get our organolithium reagent and the lithium salt. Yeah? And as X, we can use chloride, bromide, iodide, etc. Organometallics based on magnesium halides, as depicted here, um, are commonly referred to as Grignard reagents, um, but they work analogous to what you've seen in the last slide with uh, organolithium reagents. Yeah? So the trick is uh, to attach an, an electropositive metal to your organic rest and thus create um, a good nucleophilic group here, yeah, an R minus equivalent. So you will remember the um, electronegativities from the last slide. Yeah, so we get our delta negative partial charge on our organic rest, delta positive on our magnesium, and halides, of course, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and so on. Some of the most electronegative elements in the periodic table. Yeah, gets a delta negative charge here. So again, you have a very polar bond and a good carbon nucleophile. Um, how to prepare those? Well, you can again start out with your organic halide here. 
and reacted with magnesium, yeah, with magnesium metal in either diethyl ether and THF. Yeah, THF is essentially a five-membered ring with an oxygen, yeah, a heterocycle, uh, also referred to as a furan ring. Yeah. Now, what happens here? In, this gener in the generation of this Grignard is that magnesium effectively inserts into our organic halide bond. Now let's have a look at uh, the reaction of Grignard reagents with a couple um, uh, of uh, um, carbonyl compounds here on the right hand side. Yeah? So with aldehydes, it is again the same trick. So we've got our delta negative uh, methyl group here in this particular case, which can react in our planar sp2 hybridized carbon giving us the tetra tetrahedral intermediate which then gets protonated in the workup to give us in this case a secondary alcohol yeah when it comes to uh, substitutions we're counting all organic rests uh, uh, so alkyl or, or aromatic rests yeah so here in this case we have two substituents we're not counting the hydrogen so that is a secondary alcohol yeah with formaldehyde uh, we get our primary alcohol here yeah simply because formaldehyde has two hydrogens attached to our C double bond O and with ketones we would get our tertiary alcohol. Here yeah, we can react uh, Grignard reagents with carbon dioxide as well. So oxygen is more electronegative than, than carbon as you know. So we have a delta positive charge in our carbon here and can then react on this carbon yeah, to give us very stable delocalized anion yeah, which we then carboxylate anion which we can then work up yeah, to give us our carboxylic acid here. So this brings us to the end of the first lecture. Yeah, a brief crash course and a bit of revision on carbonyl chemistry and how to make alcohols yeah, and what their properties are. And uh, next time around we will look at uh, yeah, one, one or two more ways how to make alcohols and then we'll look more in detail um, at the reactivity of alcohol. So see you next time.